And welcome back. This is part two of our presentation on, or my presentation, I should say, on uh, musical disciplines, heard in jazz, heard in some other areas. We're going to talk about sound sculptures. These are inventions of instruments that I've built. Um, and I'm going to talk about the discipline of playing a piece of fixed music, something I'm not improvising on in the case of a piece for hand gesture synchronized to pre-recorded audio. Um, again, we're hoping that this uh, presentation, part of the Speak Percussion Sounds Unheard video series, is going to be helpful for musicians of all sorts. And my goal is to share some of my work with you so you have an idea about how discipline was important in my musical development. Okay, so let's talk about two song forms. The first song form that we want to talk about is a 32-bar song form, sometimes referred to as AABA form. A, A, B, A form, meaning there's something, we'll call that A. A is representing something that happens first. In this case, it's eight bars of melody and harmony. And then it's as if somebody said, you know what, that sounds really good. I really like that. I'd like to hear it again. So we repeat it. We give it to the audience again. So the second A is once again that same material, eight bars. Now we've played 16 bars, and people are a little bit tired of that first A. It's like they're saying, okay, I get it now give us something else. And so then we have a bridge. We have this contrasting material. And that's really exciting to have a contrast. And so our next eight bars are, we might refer to as B. And then finally we return to A at the end because people are like, oh yeah, I'm a little bit nostalgic about that earlier thing. I really like that main theme. Let's go back to that beginning opening. And that takes 32 bars for the whole thing. Of course, for a jazz musician, we don't play only 32 bars, or typically we don't. We then loop it. We go back to the beginning, and then we play it in different ways. And we might loop it again, and again, and again, as many times as we like, and maybe different colleagues will join us and they'll play solos and so forth on different instruments. So here's a tune that I like very much. It's called There Is No Greater Love. And a jazz musician might confront some sort of so-called lead sheet or fake sheet like this. And it has a melody that's there and some chords, but you can play it however you like. You can make up your own sort of chord voicings and you can change the rhythms a little bit. This is all part of the discipline of jazz. Um, so we have this A section here, the first A part. <laughs> So that's actually seven because the eighth part is a pickup. Two itself, again, more or less. Slightly different idea, but here's the second eight. Sounds a whole lot like the first eight. But it has a cadence, it comes down to the tonic chord, the one chord there. Okay, but it's mostly the same material. Now we get the exciting bridge that's different. This is the third grouping of eight. wistful and nostalgic and missing that original A. So we go back to it for the last E. And that is 32 bar song form, okay? Uh, I think what I'd like to do now is actually just maybe improvise over this A, A, B, A song form and see what happens. I'm probably going to put an introduction at the beginning that's a little different where I kind of play around with the chords without articulating the melody. Um, and then I'll get into the melody and try to state it in a more or less plain manner. And then I'll sort of solo over it. And I'm going to have that melody running through my head. I'm going to be hearing it, but I'm going to be playing something different. I'm just going to sort of spontaneously invent uh, little things and so forth. And then maybe I'll play the original melody at the end and that will conclude the piece. Here we go.
Okay, so that was There Is No Greater Love, 32 bar song form A-A-B-A. -A -A. Now, one of the things I mentioned is that I was doing this kind of spontaneous invention over the top of these, I'm saying over the top is the sense that the chords are below, and in my right hand, more typically in a sort of higher uh, register, I'm sort of like doing all this improvisation. The truth of the matter is, it is true that it's improvisation. It is true that it's made up on the spot, but it's actually really a combination of things that I've already played, for the most part, not entirely. I would say something like 90% of it is stuff, little patterns, little phrases, things that are sort of in my hand, stuff that I've played. And of course, it's dangerous to rely too much on that because then it doesn't sound like it's, uh, it doesn't sound fresh. So I'm trying to find new things to do. But what is new is how I combine them. It's really kind of analogous to language. Right now, I'm in the middle of a sentence that I'm improvising. Okay, and I didn't make up the word improvisation, for example, and I didn't make up the word word, and I didn't make up the word didn't. I've just, I've used those words in my lifetime many, many times, okay? I've learned those and I've used them. So I'm not actually making up a lot of material or vocabulary as I'm speaking, but I'm still improvising. And by the way, improvising, of course, is a very, very natural state. It's kind of weird to not improvise in life as we walk down the street and we negotiate our path among other walkers or cars or bicycles or whatever. That's an improvisation. Right? When you sit down and you have lunch with a friend that you haven't seen for a while and you have a conversation with them, that's an improvisation. That's a two-person improvisation. And uh, it would be ridiculous to show up at lunch and say, like, I've prepared transcripts. I've taken the liberty of preparing transcripts for lunch. I will say this, and then you'll say this, and then I'll respond this. No, no. You're just gonna... Now, of course, there are conventions. There are things that you would expect to do. Like, I'm not going to speak the whole time. You're not going to speak the whole time. It's going to be, you know, possibly half and half-ish. Um, we're probably not going to speak at the same time often or maybe even ever. Uh, we're going to sort of take turns. Um, there may be topics that we expect to, you know, like, oh, how's your family? What's going on? Do you have a new job? And so forth. So, you know, there are topics that we might, expect. how's the weather? Um, so there are things that we might expect to talk about and that, and, and also there's a sort of duration. You know, it's lunch, so it's probably not going to be two minutes. It's probably not going to be 20 hours. Somewhere, you know, it might be 30, 90 minutes, okay? So there are some rough conventions that govern what we do. Similarly, there are some conventions here. I know that I have this form, okay? I know I have certain harmonies that I can rely on and go to. And I can also apply a lot of the vocabulary, chords and arpeggios and different kinds of patterns and scales and things like that that are at my disposal. So it is an improvisation and it's not. Um, it is an act of invention, and it's an act of relying on known commodities, um, things that are I'm predisposed to, okay? Anyway, I just wanted to share that. Um, let me show you one other AABA song form. Here's a tune called Just You, Just Me.
Okay, another example of a 32 bar song form. Let's turn our attention now to a different form that's very common, very important one, and that's the 12 bar blues. 12 bar blues, essential in jazz, essential in blues, obviously, essential in rock and roll. Um, you hear it a lot. Basically, it is a form that consists of 12 bars. You play through it, and if you have more story to tell, you loop back and you do it again and again. It's a cyclic form as opposed to the sectional form that was the 32 bar AABA song form. So this is a situation where you're going to go through these 12 bars, and then, yeah, you keep doing it until you exhaust your ideas or you, your audience is totally fatigued. Okay, so you'll notice that I have bars 1, 5, and 9 um, a little bit bolder and taller there because I wanted to divide the 12 bars into a triptych of three four bar units. Four plus four plus four. That's important because some important things, some significant things happen on bars one, five, and nine. That's why I'm sort of articulating that. One of the things is we sometimes have a text, uh, lyrics, that work in, the, in this form of A, A, B. That is, we'll say something and then it gets repeated and then we have some sort of contrast to that or some sort of like consequent to that. So it can have, you know, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. You ain't never caught a rabbit. And you ain't no friend of mine. Right? Then you go back to the top. So that was 12 bars. Right? You have the ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. And it's as if somebody said, what? What was that? I missed that. Oh, okay. You ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. Okay, I get it. And now I'm a little bit bored of that. So what? Okay, so B, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. Okay. I mean, we could make up our own, you know, my baby left me. I'm so sad and blue. My baby left me. I'm so sad and blue. If she don't come out soon, I'm gonna hit her with my shoe. Late last night, my baby, you know, I can continue, go back to the top if I have more story to tell. Okay, so that's happening with the text. It doesn't always have work that way. Turns out that musicians are, you know, a tricky bunch. They, they don't stick to these forms all the time. This is a general form. This is a kind of like a quintessential version, an essential version of the 12 bar blues. But in the real world, it gets much more fuzzy and foggy, and that's wonderful. There's a lot of complexity. But a basic blues would have this A, A, B comportment or behavior in the lyrics. And you'll find a lot, a lot, in fact, do that. Okay, so another thing that happens is a kind of call and response, call and response. So, you know, you might have somebody saying something and then somebody responding. It could be one person saying something, a group of people responding. Um, it could be an instrument that's saying something and an instrument that's responding. It could be an instrument saying something and a voice responding. It could be a voice saying something and then the instrument responding, okay? And it could be every two bars, as I suggested in this sort of scheme here, or it could be at some other, it could be every one bar, so you'd have twice as many call and responses. So if I were to do something like, there's a call, there's a response. these sort of two voices, one that has, you know, the second, the first person. So here's my response. Anyway, okay, so that happens sometimes. But the other thing that a lot of students of the blues are trying to, beginning students of the blues are trying to learn is the chord progression. And of course, this is yet another discipline. We have the one chord, the tonic chord, is introduced on the first bar. And the four chord is introduced on the fifth bar. Again, the reason why I wanted to show you this triptych. Our five chord comes in on the ninth bar. Okay? Um, let's put this up here like this. And in fact, let's show that there are some other things that happen. We actually return to the one chord on bars seven and 11. So we have four bars of one two bars of four, back to two bars of one, then two bars of five, and two bars of one, okay? 
Um, I can fill this in. Here we go. Here's, here's I'm sort of doing a freight train boom pad. This is a long chord. We're in bar two, now we're in bar three, now we're in bar four. Oh, I didn't count that right. Let's do that. We're in bar one, two, bar three, bar four. Right now is bar five. Well, I've stopped time, but five, and then we have a new chord. New chord here. Bar five. Two bars. Then back to the one. Bar nine, we introduce the five, as promised. And in bar eleven, back to the one. To the top, one. Bar five, we go to the four chord. To the one. Here's the five chord. So you can actually vary these things. You can do a lot of different versions of it. Here's a whole bunch of them. This is probably a little bit more information that is, that is healthy on a video, but the point is you have a lot of variations. So the second line is the same as the first line, except I put a five chord in bar 12. The third line is the same, except you're gonna notice that in bar 10, I'm gonna move down through the four chord. Listen to this, here's the one, 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 one. choice if that's your last chorus. Good night everyone. No, no, that, the function of that five chord is to bring you back to one. You can go to the four chord in bar two. So you can kind of dial this up, you can really extend it out. Here's, here's something where we can go one, four, one, bar three, again in bar four. Four chord for two bars. One, we can go over to six, two, In bar 11 and 12, I had four chords in just two bars, which means that I'm actually splitting, I have two beats, in this case, per chord. So I want one, one for two beats, one, then six, and then two, and five, one, four, one. Here comes bar five, four chord, one, down to six, two, five, and then one, six, two, five, that's a turn. I was doing one, six, two, five before that, I don't know if you noticed, for one bar each, but then I repeated the one, six, two, five progression at double time. They were taking, in a sense, half as much time. So listen again, one, four, one, four, one, six, two, five, one, six, two, five, one. Okay, and this last line just gets kind of crazy. One, four, seven, Seven of five, one, six, four, seven of six, six, four, two, five, one, flat six, flat two, five. Okay, so really, I mean, it's just kind of a little bit insane because there, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and I don't want to confuse you. What I am interested in, in, in um, impressing upon you is the idea that it's still a 12 bar blues. You still have, throughout this thing, the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord coming in more or less at the same time. Okay. okay, that was still the 12 bar blues, but I was following that more embellished, more elaborated, more enriched harmonic pattern. Okay, let's go back to a simpler version of the blues. And Maybe you want to play along, okay? So here is my note C. I'm going to play the key of C. Here's a B. I'll hold that for a second. In case you want to tune. Here's a B flat. Let's get an A for the guitarist. If 
you want to play along, you can pause the video. Okay, so what I'm, I'm going to encourage you to do is to play an instrument, if you're a beginner, just pitch class C, concert C. Okay? That's the only note you're allowed to play. I find that this is really useful because it's very helpful, uh, it's, very, it's very problematic with beginning students who like really think that they have to know what the chords are and all the scales and everything like that. And yes, that's a discipline, it's very helpful, it's very useful to know. But to start out, it's really great to just concentrate on one note. So that's the only note you can play. Play along with me, play that note when you feel like it, okay? I'll just do a walking bass. Two courses, by the way. We did two two loops of twelve bars. Um, you know, one of the things you'll notice is you can play. You can choose when to play it, right? You play it on beat one or on beat two. You could put it on beat three, beat four. You could put it on the end of one. We could put it on different beats if we want. Um, you could do a bunch of short notes followed by a pause. Okay, we could make it a long note. So we have all the kind of articulatory kinds of things at our disposal. Where in the measure we're going to put that note. Uh, I've been playing it really kind of crudely. I mean, we can really change the dynamic, right? It can be a loud note or a short note. Okay, so play along with me now. You can have uh, you can have B flat too, concert B flat. So we got two pitches. It's really not the pitches as much. I'll prove this to you by like removing the individual fingers of my hand, which I which I kind of like to have most of the time. But let's just make it like one big cluster thing. Like imagine I'm wearing a big mitten. Okay. <laughs>
necessarily what you want to do. But the point is that the gesture, the emotion, the articulation, the dynamic, when you play, how you play, this is as important and I think ultimately more important than what pitches you play. So start out with an easy kind of thing where you're just playing a tonic pitch and add a couple pitches and so forth um, to the mix. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about that? Um, yeah. I would say that this is really, um, this whole thing of playing jazz piano is what I would call an exercise of discipline in conventional spaces. So what do I mean by that? Conventional spaces, this is a sort of traditional art form. Um, it's not as old as like some classical music traditions, but jazz has been around a long, long time. There's a lot of people who play it. There's a lot of people who know about it, a lot of listeners who care deeply about it. So it's a kind of conventional cultural space. It's not that unusual, right? It's not just like one person doing it. This is like generations of people who are playing jazz. And so you really, so these kinds of, the, the things that help me is to know about the forms, right? To understand my instrument. Oh, I remember something I wanted to say about articulation. Some of you don't have p instruments as crude in terms of their envelope of sound as the piano. Some of you have things like saxophones or guitars with volume knobs where you can swell in. So that's something the piano doesn't do very well. It doesn't actually do it at all unless you kind of repeat notes and change the volume. Once you hit a note, it only fades. I can't swell this note. I can't make this note louder unless I rearticulate it. Anyway, that's an, I meant to mention, this is another parameter that's really useful for wind and brass instruments and so forth. Anyway, back to my conventional cultural space. You know, so I've got, it's been really useful for me to sort of, um, you know, study these forms with some rigor. So this, the discipline um, in, uh, in jazz is really, you know, it's about engaging with the tra traditional forms, okay, um, such as 12-bar blues. Um, really, uh, the understanding and practicing jazz in, invites rigor. You know, there's there's no substitute for it. You just you have to practice. You got to immerse yourself in it. You have to work hard. Um, but when you have those tools, it affords self-expression, and that's really one of the goals of the musician. All right, that's the end of part two. Uh, we're going to move towards part three, where I'm going to share some ideas about instruments other than conventional ones. So some untraditional instruments, some invented instruments. Uh, I wanna share with you a sound sculpture that I invented. All right, so we're gonna be back uh, in a moment for part three. See you then.